like to introduce our keynote speaker this morning, Travis Allen. Travis is an international motivational speaker, president and founder of iSchool. He is a young visionary promoting digital learning in the classroom. Before graduating from high school, Travis created a viral YouTube video on revolutionizing America's education through the use of mobile technology. Today, he is a senior at Kennesaw State University, where he operates his growing nonprofit organization, iSchool Initiative. With the support of his team, Travis has presented in over 40 states and seven countries, allowing him to reach an audience of over 200,000 people. He has been featured on CNN, Huffington Post, and Forbes. In 2011, he was the winner of Google Young Minds competition, and in 2012, he was invited to the White House for the Education Data Palooza. Travis is quickly becoming one of the most influential leaders of the emerging digital learning movement. Will you please join me in welcoming Travis Allen. Good morning. I think we can do a lot better than that. Let's try again. Good morning. All right, it's a little bit better. We'll see how we get by the end of it. I just want to ask a couple questions here real quick. How many of you here are teachers? Teachers. Uh, how many of you are administrators? How many of you have uh, another fancy title? A couple of you. How many students do we have in the room? Okay. Let me rephrase that question. How many lifelong learners do we have in the room? Fantastic. Well, like it was mentioned, my name is Travis Allen. I am a college student at Kennesaw State University. Does anyone know where that is? Georgia. Georgia, yes, Georgia. We are the second largest university now. We are 36,000 students, and uh, we just got our first football team six months ago. Undefeated, we've won every game with above like 30 points, I think, at this point, so we're moving on up, so you'll hear about us very soon. I'm also the founder of an organization called iSchool Initiative, and I'm here today to share my journey of becoming a lifelong learner, and really what that means to be a lifelong learner. I also want to talk about how schools, teachers, and the students themselves sometimes get in their own way. How do we end up getting in the way of our pursuit to become lifelong learners? So I want to start with the journey. As some of you may have uh, noticed, I was not born in the same time period as some of you here today. And so what I want you to do is walk in my shoes, imagine what it's like to grow up in the information age, surrounded by technology. And I want to start by showing you some of the technology that already existed before I was even born. 1989, the first Nintendo Game Boy was released. Does anyone still own one of these devices? They're worth over $1,000 on eBay right now. The first cell phone in 1984 priced at $4,000. I don't think they're worth anything on eBay. I was born in 1991, and this is where my journey began. And during the first decade of my life, these companies came into existence and shaped who I am. Companies like eBay, Amazon, Google, Wikipedia, and many, many others. But by the time I was 12 years old, I received my first computer. And at the age of 12, I had the ability to explore the world around me. The possibilities were endless. A year later, I received my first cell phone, the uh, Nokia brick there. And this is where my journey began as a mobile learner. Now, by the time I was 14, I loved to play video games. How many of you here love to play video games? A couple of you. How many of you have a spouse who plays way too many video games? A couple of you. How many have kids who play video games? I want to tell you a quick story. Video games were a big part of growing up for me. And uh, when I was 14, I loved to play the MMORPG games. Does anyone know what that stands for? MMORPG, yes. Massively multiplayer online role-playing game. Somebody give them a high five. So 
These are the games where you're playing with millions of other players all around the world. You're playing with real people. And I played this one game called Star Wars Galaxies Online. And iSchool Initiative is not the first organization I created. When I was 14, I created my first virtual business inside this world. And after a year of playing, I became one of the wealthiest people in the server, and I had 30 and 40 year olds working for my virtual company. Everything I learned through this video game, I'm now applying to my everyday life today. So video games were a big part of growing up. And then when I turned 16, I dove into the world of social media. Now, not only did I have a voice, not, not only could I share, uh, explore the world around me, but I had a voice. For absolutely free, I could share a message with the entire world. This is one of the most groundbreaking pieces of technology, and yet most of our youth don't even realize the potential that's right in front of them. They know what Kim Kardashian had for lunch, but they don't always understand how to use it as a productive educational tool, and that's what we're going to talk about today. And then by the time I was 17, I received my first smartphone, and I did everything on this device. I took notes, read books, graphing calculator, you name it, I did it on this device. But I quickly noticed a huge divide between what I was experiencing in my real world and what I was experiencing in education. And I want to play a quick video for you that shows where we ranked as a country against the rest of the world. Since the 1970s, U.S. schools have failed to keep pace with the rest of the world. Among 30 developed countries, we rank 25th in math and 21st in science. The top 5% of our students, our very best, rank 23rd out of 29 developed countries. In almost every category, we've fallen behind, except one. The same study looked at math skills and found in these eight countries, the USA ranked last. But when researchers asked the students how they felt they had done, did I get good marks in mathematics? The kids from the USA ranked number one in confidence. So needless to say, there was this gap between my education and what I was experiencing. And uh, when I was a high school senior in Fayetteville, Georgia, I was using my phone to take notes in a history class, except for the policy in my school was no cell phones allowed. And so one day, my teacher took up my device, gave it to my principal. My principal called my parents. I think I had to pay $15 to get my phone back that day. And I was just baffled. I went home just so frustrated and asked the question, why? And could there be a better way of learning? And so that's when I did the only sensible thing and I turned to YouTube. And I spent four months making a video showing how mobile learning would transform education. Imagine if every student had an iPod Touch at the time. There was no tablets that existed, uh, just an iPod Touch. And uh, I, I want to go ahead and play the first minute of that video I created in high school. My name is Travis Allen. I'm a 17-year-old high school student at Wildwater High in Fayetteville, Georgia. I do not have a solution to America's education problem, and I need your help. My high school is experiencing massive budget cuts, <laughs> teachers are being let go, and classroom sizes are getting larger. Our public education system is broken, and it needs to be changed. I hope you'll take a moment to watch this short PowerPoint presentation I've put together that answers the question, does technology belong in our classroom? You decide. Let me introduce you to the future of American education, the iSchool. The iSchool will be built on Apple's popular iTouch platform. The iTouch is a revolutionary handheld device that is capturing the imagination of people worldwide. With its easy-to-use touchscreen interface, it has set the standard for music, video, and third-party applications. With the right plan, this simple device could change the face of public education. The idea is simple. Imagine a schoolroom with no books, no paper, no expensive copy machine, and no more number two pencils. Impossible, you say? 
So I'll go ahead and stop it there, but this video I created in high school began to go viral. I actually found out about a year ago, uh, Steve Jobs found the video and started promoting it through Apple Education. But I started getting emails from all over the world saying, this is the way I want to learn. This is what I want to see happen in my classroom. And so that's what motivated me to go to college the next year and create the iSchool initiative. Now the iSchool Initiative, at our core, what we are is a movement to reform education. First and foremost, we are here to empower students to have a voice in education. Here we are deciding the fate of our young learners, but how often do we stop to ask our students what they want to see happen in the classroom? Secondly, we realized that putting technology in the classroom doesn't change anything. In fact, sometimes it creates lots of problems. And so we wanted to support teachers in using this technology in innovative ways. And last, we wanted to assist districts in moving to a one-to-one -one or BYOD initiative as we saw a lot of schools struggle with this process. So that's what we set out to do is at our core, we're a movement. This movement has taken us on a roller coaster journey uh, that, that we would have never expected. And just to continue with my timeline, in 2011, I entered into a Google Young Minds competition. This was an international competition hosted by Google that said if you're between the ages of 18 and 24, submit a one minute video showing how you're changing the world. I had the privilege of being selected as the, the winner that year and attended their Google Zeitgeist conference. This was a conference for only about 300 people and I knew all 300 people by name going into it. It was really cool to meet some of the people I've looked up to. People like uh, Larry Page, the CEO of Google, Sir Richard Branson from Virgin Mobile, Ariana Huffington from the Huffington Post, Will I am from the Black Eyed Peas, Tony Hawk, the professional skateboarder, but the most interesting person I met is uh, right here on the top left, and this is Peter, the creator of Angry Birds. And I'll tell you why I loved meeting Peter. He had this great message. You know, I saw this chart uh, a month ago. Here's what the chart said. It took the radio 75 years to reach 50 million people. It took uh, a telephone 50 years to reach 50 million people. It took the television 25 years to reach 50 million people. And it took Angry Birds 17 days to reach 50 million people. And so most people, they make this assumption about Peter. They make this assumption that he became this instant overnight millionaire automatically, overnight. And he painted a completely different picture. He told me that Angry Birds was the 58th game his company ever produced. 58th game. Now that doesn't sound like overnight success to me. That sounds like he failed 57 times before finally becoming successful. And this was a message that I desperately needed to hear when I was 19 at the time. Because I feel like my generation has this fear of failure. And that fear stops us from going out and achieving amazing things. And so I really enjoyed hearing Peter and his message with Angry Birds. A year later, we were invited to the White House to share our thoughts on reforming education. The reason I share this with you is what began as a YouTube video has now led us to the White House. That is the power of technology. That is the power and the tools that every single one of your students have right in front of them. Ten years ago, that would not have even been possible. But because of the way we're connected, it is. And we've also been able to reach a very global audience, traveling to uh, over eight countries now to share our message with schools and learn from these countries on what they're doing in education. And I want to tell a quick story about Finland. Finland is ranked amongst the highest in education. So our goal going to Finland was to figure out why. What sets them apart? What is so different about their system as opposed to ours? And you know, we, we, they didn't really have longer school days. They didn't really have more technology. Really, it was quite similar except for one major factor. The way the community, and most importantly, the way the students perceived their teachers. Teachers are revered in Finland. Teachers are seen as the future of their country and they're treated as such. But that is not the culture we have in the United States. How do I know this? 
I was the student none of you wanted in your classroom. I was the student who was disengaged, disrespectful, who didn't want to be there. And that's sad because I look at where I am today and I see teachers who poured into me, teachers who believed in me, teachers who went above and beyond to support me in what I was doing. And so what I gathered from Finland was we can talk about technology all we want, but if we don't focus on changing how we perceive our teachers, it does not matter. We have to change that perception. And then in 2012, uh, we wanted to reach as many people as possible. And so we thought, hey, what if we host a conference in Georgia? We invite everyone we know. We quickly found out it's very expensive to put on a conference. Very hard to put on a conference as well, as I'm sure a lot of people running this event know. And so we thought, well, why not be a conference on wheels? Why not take the show to the schools themselves? Because here's what we noticed. We would come speak at these conferences. But we were always preaching to the choir. We're always talking to the people who already get it. What about all the people back home who don't always get to hear these messages, who don't always get to see the excitement that these conferences have? So that was the idea we had in 2012. And so my team and I, we raised $150,000. We rented this bus. We uh, lived in this bus, nine guys and one girl, for 45 days. We started in Georgia, went all the way to California, up to New York, and back to Georgia again, sharing our message with anybody who would listen. I want to tell a quick story about the process of raising money uh, for this initiative. We've, we realized that, that the only way to accomplish something big is to sign a legal contract obligating you to do so. And so we signed this paperwork saying that we will owe $150,000, we had zero dollars in the bank, and we had two months to raise the money and book the cities. Four days before launch, we were $40,000 short of what we needed to make this happen. And my team comes to me, they're like, what are we going to do? Do I need to take out a student loan to pay for this? How are we going to do this? And that same day, I met with President Papp at Kennesaw State University. And I told him what we were doing. He looked at me, he said, how much do you need? And I said, $40,000. <laughs> and he wrote me a check on the spot that day. And it was at that exact moment that I realized I should have said I needed $60,000. <laughs> Might have paid for my college. But this tour experience was life changing. It, was, it wasn't about the people we were presenting to. It wasn't about us speaking to them. It was about changing us. It was about our journey of discovery and getting uncomfortable and finding out what we were all about. And this was an absolute amazing experience. And I have to tell you, the very last stop on this whole tour was back in Georgia. It was my old high school. The very high school that took my device up has now completely turned around and they're a bring your own device school district. And I had the privilege of working with the teachers that I grew up with. And this couldn't have come at a better time because my little brother started his freshman year at that high school that year. And he has the ability to learn in ways that I would have loved to have had through this process. Now, there's two things we learned from this tour. Number one, living in a bus is the worst idea ever. <laughs> Number two, 45 days is not enough to change the world. And so we launched a new bus. You may have seen this bus outside. Has anyone gone in it yet? A couple of you have gone in it so far. OK, cool. Well, the best way I can describe this bus, correct me if I'm wrong if you've been in it, is imagine if Optimus Prime and the Magic School Bus get together and have a baby. <laughs> That's basically what it is. Uh, it's the mobile classroom on wheels. You can fit about 20, 30 people on there. And the, the goal is to have that aha moment, to bring it to school districts, have them come on and see the excitement of what the mobile classroom can look like. And rather than 45 days, it's a year-round tour. We go to school districts every week, all week. Uh, I fly to meet the bus. I don't live on the bus anymore. And uh, we've been on the road for two years now to share our journey and share our message with anybody who would listen. The last thing I want to mention about my timeline, and to me the most important by far, is what we call our iSchool Advocates. We came into this industry young, excited, ambitious, probably a little bit naive. And when we came into this industry, you know, we were super excited. We're like, yeah, now's the time for education reform. Technology's being put in the classroom. Cool things are happening. 
And we were super pumped up. And then about a, a year ago, I read this article that was saying the exact same thing we're saying today, but it was written 100 years ago. And it started getting us thinking, like, why does reform happen so slow? Why are we not moving quicker into this information age, this journey? And a lot of times, you know, we put blame on a lot of people. We put blame on teachers. We put blame on administrators, on governments. Uh, you name it, we put blame out there. But I've really come to realize that I, I think it's something else. I believe that in any industry, your customer dictates the behaviors and outcomes of that industry. And one of the problems in education is that our customer is compliant with the status quo. And by customers, I'm talking about the students themselves. They're compliant with the status quo. They don't necessarily want this change. Now, I'm not talking about the change to put technology in the classroom. I'm talking about real problem solving. I'm talking about critically thinking. I'm talking about changing the way that the environment looks between teacher and student. Going away from this multiple choice memorization testing process. And, and what I have come to realize is that we are the generation of great test takers. I am phenomenal at memorizing till 3 a.m., taking the test, and forgetting it the next day. I'm fantastic at it. And so when you change that, when you take that away from me, I don't like it. And so what we realized is that we, we can sit here and try to talk about reform edu education all we want, but at the end of the day, if our customers don't demand it, if our customers don't want it, it does not matter. And so that's what we set out to do with our iSchool Advocate Program. It's a student mentorship program where we work with middle and high school students to empower them to be the leaders in their technology initiative and be the leaders in their community. And the main message we want to leave this group of young people is that the biggest insult you can give a young person is to tell them that they're the leaders of tomorrow. Because you imply they lack the ability or know how to be our leaders right now, today. And so we want to make sure every young person knows that they have the opportunity to go out there and change the world. All they have to do is set their mind to it. And in addition to this, we also want to encourage these students to lead the technology initiative in their school districts. So it's a three-day mentorship program. And what we do with the students is we reverse the roles. The students become the consultants, and the district becomes the client. And the superintendent will come in to these group of students. They'll pitch their problem. They'll say, we have uh, not enough students have devices. Students are using them inappropriately. Uh, you name it. Whatever that district is, is struggling with at the time with their technology initiative, they pitch to the students. The students have 24 hours to then turn it around and build a presentation on how they're going to build a project to overcome those challenges. We've had students go through this program all over. Probably the closest here would be Foxborough, uh, close to Boston. But just to talk about some of the ideas that these students have had. We had one group in South Carolina that uh, the, the district said, we just put an interactive whiteboard in every single one of our classrooms, and yet none of our teachers know how to use them effectively. And so the group of students called themselves the three E's, excite, educate, engage. Their logo looks oddly similar to ours. <laughs> but what they decided to do was sit after class on their own time every Thursday and meet one-on-one -on -one with teachers and help them digitize their lessons into using the interactive whiteboard if the teachers chose to. That's how they set out to solve. Another group, uh, their district just went one-to-one -one, uh, iPads, and internet access at home was only 43%. Major problem for a one-to-one -one initiative. And so they went around the county and built an interactive Google Maps of all the public Wi-Fi places to share with the district. Another group, right here in, uh, up at, what, in, near Boston in Foxborough, this girl, she had this great idea. She said, I'm sick of missing the bus. You know, she told the story about how it, apparently it snows up here. <laughs> and she would walk to school, and the bus would come at different times, and it was cold, and she hated waiting for the bus. And she just thought, hey, what if there was an app called Where's My Bus? And what if it texts your parents as soon as the, the bus came in a certain radius of their home? Wouldn't that be cool? So she got so excited about this, she pitched this, the superintendent decided to start funding it, and she is now learning coding because she has a, a reason to. 
She has a purpose to. And I'll share one other story. Oh, and by the way, what I love about this story about uh, uh, this girl building this app, getting parent buy-in and parent culture is key. We'll talk about that later. But sometimes one of the best ways to get parent buy-in is to get parents using technology every day in a positive way. It could be unrelated to education. But now that parent gets to use that app to track the bus every morning. They're having a positive experience with technology every morning. That's a big deal. Another quick story I'll tell you is this uh, advocate group in Texas. And it was led by this eighth grade girl. And she was really passionate about this idea. She, um, she came up and said, you know what I'm absolutely sick of? Cyberbullying. The way we treat people online is unacceptable. Unacceptable. And she told this story about how her best friend committed suicide the year before because of cyberbullying. She was really emotional about this project. And so what she decided to do on day three, she printed out shirts for her team. The shirt said, hashtag niceness is priceless. She was going to create a social media campaign around combating cyberbullying. And on the back of the shirts it says, I don't bully because blank. And students could write in why they don't bully. That went viral within a week within the district. Now, we can come up with these ideas all we want, but when it comes from our students, when it's led by our students, it means so much more. So that is the purpose of this program, is to build an army of students who demand more from their education, and most importantly, demand more from themselves as lifelong learners. Now, I want to take a break from my story, and I want to talk about lifelong Learning. We have many definitions for this term and what it means, and it's used a lot. I want to kind of talk about it for a moment. So could you use your, your teacher or even better, your principal voice, even better, your elementary principal voice, and tell uh, me what lifelong learning means to you? What does it mean to you? Go ahead and shout it out. Anytime, anywhere. Love it. Whatever I want. I like it. Open-minded. Always, Always searching. Flexibility. Flexibility. Process, not a product. I like it. Ask any questions. What about this side? Are we just like to sleep over here? Yes. Willingness to fail. I'm going to end it on that one because I really like that one. OK, so lifelong learning. I believe to be successful in today's information age, we have to be lifelong learners, plain and simple. With our world is changing so fast, it is predicted that the majority of the jobs you have to prepare high school students for right now don't even exist. So bottom line is we have to develop lifelong learners. We have to develop students who can think for themselves. There are three parts, I believe, three parts of an equation to be a lifelong learner. You have to have the right attitude, the right skills, and the right tools. And let's start with attitude. By attitude, I mean a hunger and a resilience, a curiosity and a need to want to learn but also a resilience to overcome the failure along the way, to overcome the struggle along the way. And I want to share a quote with you that I live by and that our organization lives by. I absolutely love this quote. If you want to build a ship, don't drum up people to collect wood and assign them tasks, but rather teach them to long for the endless immensity of the sea. Teach them to long for the endless immensity of the sea. Now here's what this quote means to me. I understand I cannot force technology. I cannot force learning on any one individual. But what I can do is inspire you. What I can do is make it to where when you go home tonight, you dream of the ocean. You smell sea salt. And the first thing you do when you wake up is you go to YouTube and you type, how do I build a boat? What wood floats? You figure out the how because the why is there. I feel like we get caught up in the how very frequently in education. And we need to go back to that why. We need to go back to that inspiration and motivating students to have a desire to want to learn. Number two, attitude is important. Skill in lifelong learning is important as well. To be a lifelong learner, Memorization is not the key skill. It's used for other things, not for lifelong learning. The key for lifelong learning that I believe is a process of find, filter, and apply. Again, it's a process. 
If I can find the right information and then most importantly create something out of that information, I will go so much further. And I want to play a quick clip for you that embodies this concept of find, filter, and apply. It's from one of my favorite movies, The Matrix. like an iPhone 16S commercial right there. <laughs> okay, so until we get to the point where we can just download it into our brain, we have to find, filter, and apply. Skill set is absolutely necessary. Now, you can have all the attitude and all the skills you want, but if you don't have the tools, at the end of the day, it does you no good. If you don't have the tools, access the tools. And yes, by tools, I do mean a mobile device, but it's not really about the mobile device. There are two terms that I think are, are really outdated. Well, first of all, I, I think it's really about learning anywhere, anytime. Internet access on the go, everywhere. And, and we use two terms in education that I think are outdated. One-to-one, -one, BYOD. This is a how. This is, this is how we get somewhere, but it, it, we end up focusing on the wrong thing because of these terms. I think a better term to describe what we're trying to do is a one-to-web or a one-to-global. Our goal is to be connected at all times. If the fastest way for your district to do that is one-to-one, -one, great. If the fastest way is BYOD or mix, awesome. That's okay. Bottom line is, are we one-to-web? Are our students connected and lifelong learners? That's the question we have to ask ourselves. So the tools are absolutely essential. In our pursuit to become lifelong learners, there's an iceberg in our way. This iceberg represents the challenges that you and I face to get there. On the surface, sometimes it seems like not enough technology. Most of us in this room know that's not quite the case. At its core, what I want to talk about are how schools, teachers, and the students themselves get in their own way in this pursuit. Let's talk about schools. I believe schools are here to create the environment and provide the tool part of the equation, the mobile device, uh, with schools. And in this process to provide mobile devices, we have seen these top 10 barriers to technology adoption. Very consistently, uh, districts have failed because they did not meet one of these 10. They, they failed somewhere along these 10 points. And I'll go over a few of these. Number one, lack of vision or leadership. If your vision is to put tablets in the classroom, then all you'll end up with are tablets in the classroom. But if your vision is to change the learning uh, experience, and this might be done through tablets, but we're moving in the right direction. Number three, curriculum. If we're no longer a sage on the stage, but a guide on the side, we must change the way we've been teaching. We can't keep teaching the same way and expecting different results. That's the definition of insanity. Number four, supplemental use to essential use. I think this is a big one. We can't just keep replacing. We can't substitute everything we used to do and now do it with technology. A PDF copy of my textbook does me no good. It may save a few trees, but it's not going to change the learning experience. I want a textbook that engages me. I want a textbook that analyzes how fast I read and then adjusts my next page to my reading level. I want a textbook that has video, audio, games built into it, customized to my needs as a learner. That's what I want to see out of technology. We have to ask ourselves, what can we do today that was impossible yesterday because of technology? Has anyone here heard of the, the SAMR model, S-A-M-R, SAMR model? Definitely look it up if you haven't. It's a very simple process. It stands for Substitution, Augmentation, Modification, Redefinition. Education loves their acronyms. But if you don't know the SAMR model, it's a great four-step process to uh, going from supplemental to essential use. Number five, lack of technical infrastructure. If our goal is to go one to web, then this piece is critical. I walked into a school district one day and they were just, they were so proud. They were like, we just deployed 5,000 tablets. And when I walked into their schools, I could not connect to save my life. If you do not have that internet access, these devices do you no good. So building your infrastructure is key. Number six and seven, I think this is where most schools struggle. The culture, the mindset. How do your teachers, your students, your administrators 
your community, how do they perceive this initiative? That is so key. We'll talk more about this a little bit later. Number uh, eight, takes too long for change. There's a term in education I'm really not a fan of. I understand that why education uses it, uh, but that term, don't take offense, is pilot program. And the reason I struggle with pilot programs is I thought the definition of a pilot program was to find out what works and what doesn't work, to share that with the rest of the world so they don't have to recreate the wheel. And yet what we find time and time again is everyone's doing the same pilot program. And it's honestly taking too long. If we have a five-year plan to get one to web, it's too late. We have to move forward quickly. We have to take baby steps moving forward quickly. We have to move forward. Number 10, schools are buying a tablet and not a learning solution. The focus was the device and not the learning. It's a device-centric learning instead of a student-centric learning. I believe technology should be like oxygen. It's invisible, it's ubiquitous, it's simply the tool that allows us to create amazing results. You know technology is being used effectively when you walk into a classroom and you can't even see the technology. That's when it's working. Five phases to overcome these top 10 barriers. Here's what we've seen. Most schools have gone backwards on this list. They start here. They deploy the devices to the students. And then they quickly realize that nobody can connect to the internet, so they're spending three months calling frantically their IT support saying, our students can't do this, we don't have internet here, things are going haywire over here. And that's three months of a negative experience with technology. That is detrimental to your culture. That will shut it down. Quickly. And so by the time you finally build the infrastructure, nobody wants to use the technology. So first and foremost, you have to create the desire, build the culture. Second, you have to build your vision with the end in mind. Third, retooling and infrastructure. Fourth, deploy your devices, provide training, and last, measurable success. How do we improve for next year? Very key pieces to integrating the tools as a school. And by the way, I have a whole session dedicated to this uh, 30 minutes after this session. If you want to know more, if you want to have, a con it's just a conversation on how to overcome these top 10 barriers, that'll be in the session afterwards, a little bit more detail. Teachers, let's talk about teachers for a moment. I believe teachers are more critical than ever. Teachers are here to inspire and provide the skill set part of the equation, find, filter, and apply. And in this journey, we have seen three types of teachers. You've probably seen these types as well. And by the way, these, this is a three types of teachers when it comes to adopting change. Adopting change. Type one, we call your sailboat. And your sailboat is the really innovative teacher. They're the teacher who just, wherever wind takes them, that's where they're going. Wherever change goes, they're going with it. They're the teacher you're probably afraid to walk in their classroom sometimes because it's a little cra crazy and chaotic, right? And so that's your sailboat. Your second type of teacher, we call your tugboat. And your tugboat's the individual who needs a little tug, but they'll get there eventually. And your third group, any guesses? Your anchors. And your anchors are those that are rooted in this fear of change. Now here's the thing about fear. Fear is one of the most powerful motivators out there. So if I'm afraid of change, change will never occur. And what we have to do in education is go from a fear of change to a fear of what will happen if I don't change. And when we have that shift, we will begin to move forward. Now your tugboats, they're your critical mass. They're your sway boat. They're the important group. They will determine if your initiative is successful or not. And at the end of the day, your tugboats will tie themselves to whoever's louder, your anchors or your sailboats. So who are you giving a voice to in your community? In addition to this, the bottom line is nobody likes change when they're a pawn in it instead of a part of it. If we can include all people in this journey, if we can include them in the decision making, if we can have more opt-in instead of forced in to make this successful, we will move quickly towards the information age. My favorite part, the students. Let's talk about students. How do students get in their own way of lifelong learning? Three points I want to share with you here. Number one, students do not know how to use technology. They know how to use it for Facebook. They know how to use it for texting and video games, but they don't know how to use it as a productive tool. 
Now ask yourself this, where do you learn to use something productively? The classroom. So if we're not incorporating this in the learning, we're already getting the negative without the positive with this. Now here's the example I will give you. Let's say that I give a graphing calculator to a group of middle school boys who have never seen one before. I guarantee you they will not be sitting in the corner figuring out how to solve complex math equations, but they will quickly find out how to type inappropriate words with the numbers upside down. We have to incorporate this in our learning so again, they can get the positive out of it. It's up to us to show them. Show them the way, role model what it means to be a lifelong learner with technology, more importantly. Number two, this piece is probably the most important of the three I'll share with you. And that is this mentality that my generation has. Uh, we are the generation of great test takers. I've mentioned this before. I want to drive this home with a story. About two years ago, I was taking a college course, and this professor uh, did all the things we talk about good teachers doing. He didn't lecture. He was a facilitator. He didn't have multiple choice tests. He just he did everything right by what I want to see out of a teacher, right? I loved this teacher. But I started asking my peers what they thought of him. And I quickly realized I was the only one who liked this teacher. So I started doing some research on a website that every college student for the last five to 10 years has lived by. And that is Rate My Professor. Has anyone used this site before? If you've been to college, you've used it, I promise you. And so what this site uh, does is it allows students to rate their professors so other students can decide if they want to take that teacher. Now remember what I said, your customer dictates behavior and outcome of your teachers. Let's find out what students hold value in with their teachers. Here's the criteria for Rate My Professor. By the way, Professor Bob, I'll call him, he had one of the lowest scores I've ever seen um, on the site. And uh, one third, here, here it is, one third of the criteria is easiness. The easier you are, the better teacher you are. The second problem I have with the site, what does the chili pepper mean? Anybody know? Your hotness. Not attractiveness, very specifically your hotness. And, you know, I, I guess your, your attractiveness affects your ability to be a good teacher. But what baffled me even more was some of the comments that students left this teacher of why he was not a good teacher. I want to read some of these comments to you. Do not take this teacher if you value your time and like to know expectations. This teacher will say he's not going to teach you. It is true. He won't teach you anything. You must teach yourself. Number two, doesn't actually teach at all, but makes you use what you've learned so far in school to do it yourself. Number three, not worth it. Not what it seems. I learned a lot about business myself, teamwork, etc. However, none of this learning took place inside the classroom. Now, if you were reading these comments, you would think these are positive comments about the teacher. And yet, these are the reasons that students don't like this teacher. And so, I will say again that we can talk about change all we want. We can, we can focus on developing the best teachers we've ever seen. But at the end of the day, if our students don't want those teachers, those teachers will leave. They will go somewhere else. That is the struggle we face in education right now. This is one of the biggest hurdles. The first question they ask when they come to college, what is the bare minimum I can do to get the A? I saw this really funny cartoon of two pictures. And it basically, it showed a picture of the 1970s. And it was a picture of a parent holding up a, a piece of a homework paper that said F on it. And the parent was holding it up to the student and said, why did you get an F? And then it says 2010. And it's a picture of a parent holding up the same paper to the teacher and saying, why did you give my son an F? And we've got this mentality of, of this you know, generation of great test takers. We have to overcome this. This is our biggest hurdle in education. We have to change this culture. Number three. Lack of skill and find, filter, and apply. 
More importantly, lack of knowing when to use the skill set of fine filter and fly. Tell you another story. My little brother loves to play Minecraft. Anybody here have kids who love to play Minecraft? Anybody here love to play Minecraft? Me as well. Okay, we're gonna go play after this. But Minecraft, by the way, is the to me the most educational, most amazingness, awesomeness game ever that I've played. Uh, and I'll tell you why. It is the only game that I've played that its only limitation is the creativity of your brain. It is the only game I've played that when you enter the world, you start with nothing and you're told nothing on how to play. You've just got to figure it out. Sounds a lot like life. And I, I bet you, most of you, if you've ever tried playing Minecraft with your kids, you probably hated it. You probably, because where were the directions? It didn't tell you what to do. You didn't have an objective. You didn't have a purpose. And, and we see this a lot, but one of the things I will encourage all of you to do, the best thing you can do, is go play Minecraft with your children. I promise you, it's one of the best things you can do. Uh, and it's amazing at what you'll experience once you get into it. But anyway, so this idea. Kids are thrown into this world, given no direction, and told to survive. How well do they do? Fantastic. They do amazing in this kind of environment. And how, what they do is every time they run into a problem, they go to YouTube, and they watch videos of how to do things in Minecraft. My little brother watches videos on Minecraft more than he actually plays the game. It's crazy. So I started doing some research, and there are 2.7 million channels dedicated to Minecraft on YouTube. 2.7 million channels. One of those channels had 5.5 million subscribers and 2.3 billion views. So my little brother's not the only one watching these videos. And what drove me nuts is that same day he went and watched videos on how to do things in Minecraft, he couldn't do his math homework. So he went to my parents, he said, hey, I don't know how to do my math homework. My parents said, I don't know how to help you. And so he gave up. He was just like, I guess I can't do my math homework today. And didn't even think to go to Khan Academy, which has only one channel, only two million subscribers, and only 500 million views. They know how to do it, but they don't always know how to do it in an educational setting. I believe we have to role model and show them how to find, filter, and apply in all that they do. So I want to take a break. I have one more uh, thing I want to close with, but before I do that, I just wanted to see real quick if there were any questions about me personally, about anything we've talked about, about maybe a struggle you're going through. Uh, obviously, there will be more time for discussion in the two breakout sessions I'm doing, but does anyone have questions they'd like to ask with the whole audience here? Yes. So her question and, and, and what she wanted, wants to discuss is, yes, we have students evaluating their teachers, but one of the bigger problems is that teachers are so heavily scrutinized, they're under a magnifying glass at all times, and that they, you know, they're, they're being evaluated sometimes on things that don't always make sense. You know, for example, you know, should we evaluate our teachers on how well their students do on the standardized test? All these kind of questions. Is that fair to say that that's kind of your, your comment question? Mm -hmm. Mm. Okay, so you're kind of limited, your hands are tied a little bit in what you can do as a teacher. Um, so I absolutely agree with you, and, and here's what we have to focus a lot on is changing legislation, changing policy, and at the end of the day, that's a, a huge task to undertake, but I believe one of the best ways to create that shift is to empower your students to lead that. Now, I mentioned that, that uh, fear is a great motivator. So if I'm afraid of change, now we're talking about legislators, if I'm afraid of change, change will never occur. And what we have to do is go from a fear of change to a fear of what will happen if I don't change. I think one of the best ways to do that is to get students 
to present the success they're having with technology in front of teachers, in front of administrators, in front of legislation to show what they're doing. Because what's going to happen is that legislation is going to look at that and go, wow, if I don't incorporate more of this into the learning, that student cannot create this success. So I think at the end of the day, it's got to come from our students. Even that change of how we evaluate from the top down, if we can get our customers demanding a different way of learning, the evaluation process will slowly change over time as well. It's not going to happen overnight. It takes a movement. In fact, there's this great TED Talk I would encourage all of you to watch. Uh, careful what you Google here, though. Uh, it's called Shirtless Dancing Guy. But put Shirtless Dancing Guy TED Talk, and you should be safe. But uh, basically, the, the premise of this video is a, uh, they're out in a field somewhere with tons of people sitting, listening to music, and this one weird guy is just dancing shirtless in the field. And he's all by himself, but eventually, two people come up, and he shows them how to do it, and they start dancing with him. All of a sudden, more people start coming up, and all of a sudden, we have 500 people sitting over here dancing. At first, he was the lone nut until people started following him. Then he became a leader. And here was the really cool part about the video. What do you think happened to the people sitting on the floor eventually? Eventually, they were ridiculed for not getting up and dancing. Where he was ridiculed at first, now they're being ridiculed for not getting up and dancing. The concept of this is called the tipping point, and it's this how to create a movement and how to move forward with this. Great TED Talk. I encourage you to watch it to kind of explore more of what it looks like. Other questions? Yes, in the back. Am I familiar with inquiry-based uh, learning? Does it fit my model? Does it fit what we do? Here's what I'll kind of comment to say about that. Uh, first and foremost, I am not a teacher. I do not focus on curriculum or pedagogy too much on, on that side. I, my goal is to, to play a very different role in this equation. So what I do understand of it, yes, it does make a lot of sense. It fits a lot with what I'm so passionate about doing. But really, the role I play is trying to figure out how to get students fired up to want to learn, trying to build the culture and build the excitement around learning successfully. So I, I love what I know about the model. I do know a good bit about it, but I, I kind of stay cautious about playing in that role too much. I know what I'm good at. I know what I'm not good at. I'm not here to be the educator. I'm not here to work on the curriculum and, and that side of things. Other questions? Yes. Great question. Uh, so, so she asked, uh, you know, for me, I, I took a negative and turned it into a positive and created something out of when my phone was taken up, where a lot of other people, uh, I tend to think, shut down a little bit when they run into this issue. Uh, let, me, let me talk about a, a book I've been reading uh, called Fall Down Seven Times, Get Up Eight. It uh, has to do with overcoming failure. What it mostly has to do with is how to develop self-motivated kids and self-motivated students in the classroom. And I actually met with this author in Texas a couple months back. And what she talks about in this book is uh, something that many of you are probably familiar with, and that's self-efficacy, uh, which is the belief uh, that you can change your environment or change what's around you. And one of the things she talks about is that in order to develop critical thinking, creative uh, problem solvers, our students have to have self-efficacy. They have to truly believe that they can make a difference that they can change the world. And if they have that mentality, they'll start taking these negatives and saying, you know what? I can go do this. You know, so for me, I was fortunate to have parents who instilled this in me. And when I went home that day, when my phone was taken up, I was your typical student. I was complaining. I went to my parents and I started whining about how the school did this. And rather than my parents saying, that's the way it is, my, my dad basically said, Stop talking and go do something about it. You have the ability to change education as we know it. Nothing, especially with technology and the information age, nothing can get in your way if you set your mind to it. So I was fortunate to have a parent 
who had that mentality and who then helped me make that video for the next four months and helped me produce it. I think education could emulate some of that though. If we can focus on building self-motivated students, if we can build the confidence in the students, if we can tell them on a regular basis, what can you do today? How can you go solve real world problems today? I think they'll start developing this attitude of when a challenge comes their way, they don't shut down, but they open up. They do the opposite. So that's what I've kind of experienced through this journey. Yes? You know, that's a, a great, great question, which I kind of want to explore now even more so on my own. Like, how do we really define those two things? I think I get what you're kind of saying with the, the self-esteem. You know, we've got very confident students, right, in what, in what we're doing, but not always confident in the areas which matter most. Not, only, not always confident in, in knowing who they are or what they want to accomplish or, or that they can go make a difference. They're confident in how they do in tests and how they do in things. And I think that's really the difference. But I don't think I have a specific answer. Um, but I'm, I myself am interested in kind of exploring the difference between those two as well. Other questions? Yes. Well, I, I will comment on that. So he's talking about how he, they went BYOD. Uh, you know, they said, students, you can bring the devices, and, and only 40% are actually doing it. At this point in time, 40%. By the way, uh, gathering that kind of data, that information is, is critical. Uh, we partner a lot with Bright, Clarity Bright Bites. Has anyone used Clarity Bright Bites before? It's literally the coolest stuff ever. Basically what they do is they evaluate, uh, they, they evaluate teachers, administrators, and students, and they'll ask questions like this. They'll ask teachers, uh, do you use an interactive way to collaborate beyond the classroom on a weekly basis? And 80% of the teachers will say, yes, I do. And then they ask the students, does your teacher use a collaborative thing to you afterwards uh, on a weekly basis? And 15% of students say, yes, they do. And so you start to identify where the gaps are and where the miscommunication is, which it sounds like you have some of that data. 40% do this. So, so here's the thing I've experienced again. We can put technology in the classroom all we want. We can change our policy. By the way, a BYOD program is not just changing your policy. If all you've done is, is change your policy to say we allow devices now, and I'm not saying you, you do that, uh, but if that's all you do, it's not a BYOD policy. One of the things we talk about a lot is a, a BYOD essentially should cost the same almost as a one-to-one -one because you have to invest a lot in infrastructure, professional development, culture building, you name it. And at the end of the day, I think we have to go back to our why with technology. There's a great TED talk from Simon Sinek called Starts With Why. And basically what it talks about is, it, it, it gives an example. If you ask Dell what you do, they will say, uh, say, we build computers. If you ask Apple what they do, Apple will say, we defy the status quo. They focus on the why and the how and the what come later. So, Everything we do with technology, with the BYOD plan, there has to be purpose and meaning behind, and we have to also provide a lot of structure to support our teachers in facilitating that experience. Now, we have time for one more thing I want to share real quick, and I, I don't want to eat into your, your 30 minute break here, so I'll leave you with this. My last slide here. Throughout this journey, I have learned to work hard, fail a lot, but learn more. And I will tell you, my greatest fear growing up since the time I can remember all the way up until college has always been public speaking. I was the student that was so deathly afraid of getting up in front of people, I said, I'll build the PowerPoint, you do the presentation. 
And I got through most of high school without ever speaking in front of people. And when I went to college, I created the iSchool Initiative, went to college, my mentor, uh, by the way, uh, my dad always told me you are the sum of the five people you spend the most time with, uh, so who are you spending your time with? And so one of the first things I did when I went to college is I formed my own formal board of mentors for me personally. And so one of my board of mentors, he told me, if you're not willing to change, you'll never change anything. And so he forced me in a room about this size on our college campus. I did a presentation called Top 10 Apps You Can't Graduate Without. I had a total of six people show up. Four of them were my college roommates. And 10 minutes into my presentation, I completely choked. I had to walk off stage. I couldn't even present to six people for 30 minutes. And I learned that day that anything worthwhile takes getting uncomfortable. When is the last time you got uncomfortable? It takes being a lifelong learner. It takes overcoming failure. Malcolm Gladwell, 10,000 hours to become an expert in anything you do. And so from that moment on, I decided to live my life like Jim Carrey from the movie Yes Man. And if you've seen this movie, it's a simple premise. Uh, Jim Carrey, he, he lives this boring life. He says no to everything, right? He's a no guy. No, I don't want to go to lunch. No, I don't want to do that. And then he gets cursed to have to say yes. And within a few weeks, he goes on this roller coaster journey just by one word, yes. And so I wanted to live my life by saying yes to everything, getting uncomfortable, putting myself out there, and most importantly, work hard, fail a lot, but learn more. Thank you so much for your time today.